So, my name's Graham. I work for Intel, Intel's Open Source Technology Centre. Uh, I've been working on CATA containers for a couple of years now. Uh, Judy Straw Pole. So, who's heard of CATA containers before this conference? Uh, that's, that's not bad. The, the guys over here don't count, seeing as they work on CATA. So, that's, that's cheating. So, um, so introduction today to. So, it's not going to be too technical, there's a couple of technical slides. It will be a balance of, you know, an overview of what is it, why would you want it, and then a few technical bits and pieces, because you can't really not see those and understand what it is. And then we'll move on to how we can get it, use it, and contribute. So, so yeah, what is CATA? Uh, and then we'll do a little bit of the architecture. How do you integrate it? You know, it's, has to be used in some sort of framework that you guys are probably using. Where are we heading with it? You know, it's an ongoing project. Um, and then, how do you get it? So, who uses containers? Probably lots of people in the conference we're at. And who uses virtual machines? Anybody use virtual machines and containers? which is a fairly common, you know, you want to wrap, whether you know it or not, a lot of the cloud services are VM-based, but quite often you'll want to wrap a VM around that container or that stack of containers. So in the, in the world of containers and VMs, um, generally we have a payoff between speed and isolation, security. So and traditionally over here we have our nice containers. Great, they're, they're really quick. We love them, deployment, simplicity, tooling. So, but on the isolation front, yeah, software isolation is great. It, you know, nothing's perfect. And we have our virtual machines over on the left. Traditionally, much bigger, much slower. You know, you've got boot time of minutes, size of hundreds of megabytes. So, CATA containers is really a, a blending of those two. We wanted to give people the security and isolation of virtual machines but we didn't want to give them that overhead, that bloat, that speed hit. So what we have is we have the isolation of the full virtual machine with the hardware backed security. And we have the tooling of the containers and we have a lot of the speed of the containers. So it, it is a VM. There's always going to be some sort of VM penalty. I think that's probably never going to go away without a few tricks here and there. So. Uh, and how do you use CATA containers? Um, tool? All intents and purposes, it, it looks like RUNC. It's an OCI-compatible runtime. Um, you could swap out, you could rename it RUNC, stick it in your stack, and it would work. That's a bit skanky. What we actually do is, in the modern world, you have OCI layers and OCI compatibility, CRI and Kubernetes. So you can have a parallel runtime. So it's an OCI-compatible, you can have RUNC, you can have CATA. And you can run them together, you can run different pods in different containers in different runtimes. So you can have some of the containers running in RunC if you have requirements or you don't have such strict security requirements. And then you can have other ones running inside CATA. So here we have um, OCI compatibility, Kubernetes, we plug into CIO, we'll have a diagram later. Docker is where we really began with this. Anybody name the dolphin symbol? Took me a while to dig this up. I believe that is the symbol for Zoom. So if you're doing an OpenStack integration, you can use Zoom to drive Docker, which can then drive Kata. So my, my folks, when they were reviewing the slide set, were going, that's new. What's with the dolphin? <laughs> I thought, we were at the OpenStack summit. I really should put Zoom in there. So. Some history. Um, say I've been working on this for two, two and a half years. Um, before Kata, there was clear containers. So, in fact, it was two years ago in Berlin at the Open Source Summit that we were doing a Clear Containers presentation and the guys from Hyper were doing a Hyper RunV presentation. And we're like, hold on, we're, we're basically presenting the same thing. We've both been working on this source base in parallel. So a year later, we merged that into the OpenStack Foundation as an open upstream project. And then we hit our V1 release and we're 1.3.1 was released quite recently, and we're really pushing to do a, a 1.4 release. Uh, I'd love to say this week, but half the developers are, are sat in the front row. So that may or may not happen given network availability and beer. So 
No drinking and releasing, Eric. No. <laughs> so let's explain a bit more about how CATA looks, what it is. So, so your traditional containers, you have a host, you have a kernel, your containers run within namespaces on that host. You have some security, you've got SecComp, you've got capabilities, your namespace, your C groups, which is great unless somebody breaks out of a container, which you know, has happened, at which point you have access to all the containers, potentially, particularly if you break into the host kernel. So, yay. So, then you, some of you said you, know, you run virtual machines and containers. So quite often that will be you'll run a virtual machine with a container stack within it, running multiple containers. And maybe you have a different virtual machine per customer. Maybe you have sort of noisy neighbor issues. Maybe you want some isolation between multi-tenancy. So that's fine, but you've still got a traditional VM. You have now have to manage a VM, and then you have to manage a container stack in the VM. And where CATA is different is we, we have very lightweight virtual machines. We've optimized. They're based on the same virtual machine technology as the virtual machines you'll be running every day. But we have basically every, I'm going to use the words container and pod interchangeably through the talk. So, so every container gets its own virtual machine. It gets its own kernel. So it gets its own isolation. So you're effectively, you're running a container in a VM but all the orchestration level is done out on the actual bare metal host. So you, know, you plug into your normal Kubernetes deployment, you deploy it with the Kubernetes tools, but it's actually deploying your container in a VM. And your container shouldn't know. In fact, I've, I've got an annoying thing right now. We're just about to merge a pull request adding some SecComp support. I'm not sure how I test that, because I'm sat in the container going, is it on? I can't tell. Brilliant. Annoying for a developer, but that's what it's meant to be like. Your container is now running. It doesn't know it's in a VM. It's just a container. So this is, this is really the quick overview of this is CATA. CATA is running each container or each pod in its own private VM. So we talk about how is it architected? How do we actually do this on the slightly more detail level? And how do we integrate that into Docker Kubernetes? I may or may not talk through all of these in detail. Um, we, we are a VM. So these are the basic components we have in our cat over on time. Um, we do use QMU. Out the box, we use QMU and KVM as the VM stack. We have a runtime, like you'd have Run C under Docker. We have a runtime. It's called imaginatively Cata runtime. You, you can rename it to whatever you want. Um, we have a kernel to sit inside the VM. Um, you can have a different kernel per VM. So if you have specific kernel features you want for one container but not another, you can optimize and refine your kernel on a per container, per pod basis. And then we have a root FS. Um, the container never sees this root FS. We, we need, it's a VM, it has to boot something. It can't boot a raw container. There's not enough stuff in a container. So we have a very small root FS. We boot into the root FS, which then sets up the container inside the VM. Um, the shim and the proxy, I'll skip for the moment. The agent, ultimately, we need work to happen in the VM. Somebody has to configure the mount points, the networks, the memory resources, the C groups. So we have a thing called the agent, and that's really the workhorse. So the runtime talks to the agent and tells it what does it need doing in the VM. I'm going to let people stare at that for a moment while I grab my water. You might notice on here uh, I've skipped the proxy. Um, the proxy is something we're working away from. So now we've moved to using VSOX, which is a fairly recent kernel feature. The, the proxy is less involved in the picture. So you have your virtual machine with your pod with multiple containers or single container running different commands. Uh, here we have the agent outside of the container namespace. That's really the controller of the container. Kernel hypervisor. And then runtimes, I don't know if most people realize that, that runtimes like Run C, they're very transient. When you do Docker Run or Kubernetes launch, or 
it launches a runtime which does a load of setup and then it, it dies. The runtime doesn't hang around. So the runtime is a transient thing. But then there's another process that your stack, say Docker, needs to monitor to see if your container is still running, ask it for statistics. Traditionally, that would monitor your actual container process. But we can't do that. And the default would have been it would have started looking at QMU and going, oh, I'll monitor QMU. It's like, well, that's not really what you want to be looking at either. That's not going to give you the information you're after. So we, we have something called the shim. And the shim does the I.O. and it allows the monitoring to say, I'm going to watch the shim, and the shim basically translates information out of the VM and says, you ask me a question, I'll tell you what you should actually be asking. So, so that's really our stack up. When we come to Kubernetes, so here we have, um, we have an OCI compatible runtime. So Kubernetes now has CRI. Um, uh, this part I'll probably explain that a lot of the work we've done for the last couple of years is worked with the Kubernetes SIGs and the OCI group. Um, when containers began, there was no notion of VM containers. So you'd find things in the spec or in the implementation that were very, let's call them VM unaware or even VM unfriendly, which made our life really difficult. We'd try to plug the VM in and it just wouldn't fit or there would be presumptions. We've, Eric found a line of code the other day that had a hardwired call to Rumsey in the middle of the code base. It's like, that's not going to work for us. We're, we're not Rumsey. So we spend a lot of time working with the community and sort of the organ people who are doing the specs to make sure that the future implementations will handle virtual machines. And part of that work was working with CRI. So we, when CIO came out, we made sure that it would be able to talk to um, CATA containers. And to clarify, you can have CATA containers running as well as Romsey. It's not an either or. It's not a replacement. It, it, you drop it in side by side. And you can choose, particularly in Kubernetes, you can choose on a per pod basis which runtime do you want to use. So you can say, well, this pod is fairly lightweight. I trust it quite a lot. Let's just run that in Rumsey. I'd like the speed. But this one, it's an unknown entity. I don't trust it. Definitely run this one in the CAT container. So, so that's how we fit in. Uh, and it, it's fairly seamless. You, know, you get all of the tools from Kubernetes and Docker and your stack that you'd normally have. You know, you, and you can do it at a global level. You can say make the default runtime cutter, or you can do it on a poor per, per pod container basis in the configuration file. Containers aren't really anything without networking and storage. If you, if you have no network or storage, you, well, you've got a processor, but it can't get any data unless it's in the image and it can't store it anywhere. If it's in the image, you can't write to the image without file system backing. So we'll cover networking storage, which are fairly key components. They're also one of the places where we spend some time. VM networking is subtly different from container networking. VM storage is different from container storage. So we have to do some work in this area for compatibility. So the basic networking, um, containers runner, and I, 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 my OS, my I model history is a bit fuzzy in my head, I believe. Containers are running at basically L3. But VMs tend to run at L2, so you can't, by default, out the box, plug the container network straight into VM. There's, there's, no, there's a mismatch. So we run a Mac VTAP in the middle, so we can then match between those two levels. Um, out of the box, for 90% of the situations, this works. You plug it in, your network appears, magic stuff happens, your networking's in your container. But there are some situations where you want to optimize your networking or you have a different setup. So I know I've spoken to some people before. Anybody use DPDK, et cetera, acceleration techniques? So we, we can plug DPDK directly into the virtual machine. So you don't have to go through the Mac VTAP layer and the extra layers in the L2, L3 translation. So if you're running a, an accelerated software stack for networking, there's probably a direct route into the virtual machine. So you can plug that straight in and get the full benefit uh, of the speed. Uh, anybody doing SIOV or NIC assignments? So, so we also support NIC assignment and we, we can assign a, a whole 
raw hardware NIC or we can do a virtualized NIC with SROMV. So you can assign those directly into the virtual machine as well. So, so we have the acceleration techniques available that you, you might use as a, a medium to high end container user. Storage. Storage is an interesting one. Um, I'll work down from the top. Uh, anybody used to 9PFS? Uh, if you're using virtual machines, you may have come across 9PFS. It's a very easy to use um, network-based file system from Plan 9 OS. Uh, it's used a lot in virtual machines because it's very simple to plug in and, and it pretty much just works. So, so out of the box, our default connection, depending on your graph driver, uh, in Docker they're called graph drivers, I'm not sure about the Kubernetes terminology, depending on how you're doing your backing store on your host side, if you're using overlay then we'll use 9PFS. Um, it mostly works, but it's not quite a full POSIX Unix file system. So once in a while you come across a small anomaly and we'll, we'll find a container that's doing something particularly strange that doesn't work, and we'll track it down, it'll be 9P as an issue. So then we worked on block devices. If you're running a backing store, say Device Mapper as your um, graph driver, then as a VM we can go and find the block device that presents to the host and map it directly into the virtual machine and then mount it. So now not only you've got a full file system mapped in, so you're now compliant, it's also not going over the network connection, so it's actually a lot quicker as well. So that's enough a preferred optimized method we have for mounting file systems. Um, the thing we use, um, I should probably backtrack a little. I expect if I stop now and said questions, somebody might ask, what's the overhead costs? So um, it's a VM, we do have overheads, yeah. but boot overhead, you can boot into a container in well under a second. So uh, RUMC isn't much quicker than that. And then disk wires or footprint, we consume, I think, somewhere in the region of 50 megabytes per container. So, and if you look at a traditional KVM QMU, you stick a naught on the end of those easily. Yeah, that's a much bigger footprint. And one way we've optimized this is we use a thing called NVDIN non-volatile memory <coughs> mapping. So we have a fake non-volatile memory which we direct map, DAX is a direct access mapping into the kernel. So for our root FS, we basically map that directly into the memory of the VM, bypassing all the caches. So it is a one-to-one -one memory map straight from the host into the virtual machine. That saves us a bunch of time, speed, booting, it saves us a huge amount of footprint and cache footprint. You can use that as a user. If you had a fixed image you wanted to map into your container, we have the ability to do that through the same method. I'm not sure I've seen any customers using that in anger yet, but it's available. And then, most people are probably actually doing their storage over networking, over Ceph, Cluster, or some of the other networking. So to your, you, know, you don't generally have your networking on your host, you may have it remote. We have a network connection, network storage just works as you'd expect. Yeah. You configure it in your container, it plugs in, you pee. Roadmap, it's an active project. Um, we have features we're adding, we have extra support we're doing. So we are predominantly about security and isolation. You, you don't normally run the VM to get an extra feature. You know, there are some extra things you can do, maybe on the SRI or V type work, or you want a different kernel, but generally it's about that hardware backed layer around your container. So, and then we distinguish between are we doing the security inside the container, inside the VM, or are we doing it host side? And quite often we'll have a debate, like in SecComp, we've just added SecComp support. Do we put the SecComp around the container inside the VM, or do we wrap SecComp around the QMU on the host? Uh, and we tend to make a decision, we do one or the other. We don't normally do a security layer at both. Quite often here, I'll have, if, I, if I wasn't on a live broadcast YouTube audience, I'd probably have a picture of Shrek. See if anybody gets the reference. Security, security is like an ogre. No, that's, security is like an onion. It's made of layers. So, and the Shrek reference is ogres are like onions. They have layers, not they make you cry and they smell. So, security is hard, but it's all about layers. So we could have all the layers inside the VM and all the layers outside the VM, which would be 
fantastic for security, but each layer comes with a cost. Comes with a footprint cost, comes with a speed cost. So we, we tend to make a choice and normally put them at one or the other. So we've just added SecCom in the container. We're hoping to get that merged this week. And then on the host side, we're doing more C group isolations. We're doing more namespace isolations. So namespace and C group are one of the places we do actually have. In, in the VM, we use the same library Run C does. So it's very much you have a Run C style container in the VM. So that's namespace and C grouped. And then we also wrap some of those around QMU outside. So, and sometimes that happens for us, such as Docker will place our runtime into a network namespace by default. Rootless QMU, this is one that's bugging Eric at the minute. Um, we're pretty sure we can do that. We don't have that at the moment. We'd like that. You, why would you want your QMU VM running as root on your host? We don't have to do that. Let's make that work. And then SE Linux policy, we're going to work on an SE Linux policy for the runtime, the QMU on the host side. So to wrap it on the host. Networking. We've just made a change which is probably going to become the default from our VE VMAC setting. We're now using um, TC mirroring. That gives us some more compatibility benefits, but a very small performance cost. And when we add new features like this, we have, we have a large TOML-based config file for the runtime. So quite often we'll put a switch in the config. So we may say by de default we're using TC mirroring, but there's always going to be a switch that so you can say, actually, I want to go back to the VMAC or I want to turn this feature on. So we're very much about there's a spectrum of needs for CAT containers. Sometimes you want all the security and you don't care about the speed. Sometimes you don't care about the size. Sometimes you care about one or the other and then you can tune it. Okay. So we're always optimizing the default path on networking. We're always looking for more performance. Um, Docker Swarm DNS is an interesting one. When you do a Docker Swarm, it sets up its own DNS controller, and that causes us some issues on our networking side, which we think we've now got a solution for. So. And then a new one, enlightened CNI plugins. Sometimes you're writing the CNI plugin, and you know you're going to be running on a CAT container. You know you've got a VM networking stack, and you know there's an optimization you want. But by default, there's no way for the CNI to pass the information across to CATA. So recently we've had a PI. I think the PR was merged, Eric, in CNI? I think, yeah, so, so we've, we've got a CI, it's either open or it's merged. It might be under discussion where you can now add effectively hints or attributes into your CNI network config, and they will make it through to CATA, and then CATA can tweak the system appropriately for the best use case. So, so that's quite a nice add-on feature. And what normally happens with these things, if you add a tweak and it lands at a runtime that doesn't support it, you end up with a workable system. It just may not be as optimal. File systems. Um, 9P. It works, but it is not our ideal solution. So I'll drop down one. We, we did look at NFS VSOC, um, which works and might be slightly better than 9P, but it's NFS. It always comes with its own caveats. But there's some work ongoing. Um, it's under discussion. I think there's some, it's not published yet or not widely published. But another group, not inside CATA, have been working on Vertio FS. So it's basically running a fused file system over a socket, so over Vertio. That's going to give you a much more compatible file system over a much cleaner, faster transport. So we're quite excited to see that coming. If that works out, which it looks like it will, I imagine we'll flip that to being our default rather than 9PFS. Uh, cache enablements. Um, a lot of my time is spent running metrics to see how we're performing and where the hotspots are. And it came to realize that we're a VM. So inside the VM, we've got mount points, and they're being cached by the block cache. But they're mapped through to the host, who's through QMU, who's also enabled caching. And in some situations, this, this works really well. You've now got a cache shared across containers on the host, but you've got your own local one as well. Other situations, you're just duplicating the data. So you now have to traverse an extra layer, so it's a little bit slower. And then you're holding probably the data twice, so it's a little bit bigger. So, so I'm going to be adding some tweaks to the config so that you can say, at what level do you want to do your file system caching? Do you want to do it at both? And then there's all the complexities of do you want it right through, right back? 
So, so that's going to be fun. Other features. A uh, feature we're working on right now is live upgrades. Um, we're, we've got a reasonably aggressive release cycle, which we're working on. And we, you know, we don't want to put the customers in a position where they can't migrate. They have to shut everything down and re reinstall. It's like, no, you, you need to be able to live upgrade. This is a key feature of your stack and your live system. More device mappings. Um, Docker has this interesting privilege mode. So, and every now and then, probably once a month, we get somebody saying, so I've run Kata with a Docker priv, and it, it didn't work, or not as I expected. It's like, so, so priv mode basically says, give me access to the whole of the host, and we're trying to run inside a VM. How did you think that was going to work? There's some, there's some, we do support some features of priv. Sometimes somebody just wants a device pass through, but there are things we just cannot do. So, so priv mode may never fully work in Kata. So, but what we will do is try and add more and more support for the, the device pass-through. Um, more hypervisors. Um, I was asked this early on, on the Intel stand. By default, we run uh, QMU KVM out of the box. We really want to support more hypervisors. Some of the L0 hypervisors are going to be really hard to do, but, but we're looking at other hypervisors that we can slide into Kata. There's a, there's a whole library of neutrality in Kata called virtual containers. And, and that is designed that you can just slot in more, more of almost anything, so particularly hypervisors. So if anybody wants to, you've got a favorite hypervisor they want to see supported, just come along and have a chat. You know, we'll help you merge that code in. Non-Linux workloads. Um, quite often, every now and then, somebody will come up and say, hi, you know, my, my container isn't, it's not a Linux container. Can you run my workload? The immediate answer is, not today, and then the, the moderately easy answer is, it shouldn't be that hard. The only thing, as far as I'm aware, that really would need doing for a first step is porting the agent. We need the agent to talk to inside the VM. So we have a Linux agent, we run a Linux wrapper around our containers. So if somebody were to port the agent to a different OS, that would be a really big step to running a different non-Linux workloads inside the containers. And I guess there, there's a major upside to Kata against um, your traditional soft container. We have a separate kernel. We have a, you, in theory, can run a different OS. So you could probably mix and match containers of different OSs in Kata. Size and speed. We're always looking at size and speed. We, we have this playoff. Everybody wants new features and more features, but every feature costs you something. It costs you a bit of size, costs you speed. So we try and strike a balance and we try and make it configurable but we do try to keep an eye on our growth. Yeah, we don't want to bloat with featureware. Getting, using, contributing. So it's on GitHub, it's all open source. We're hosted under the OpenStack Foundation. So it's Apache 2 license. Um, we have a number of packages available. We're working with a bunch of the vendors, the distros right now. So we have RPMs, devs, we've got an APK. We're working closely with the SUSE guys right now. We have a Snap, which makes it easy to install on a number of platforms. Uh, we have it installed in our own clear Linux distro. And then you can reach us. Slack is quite popular right now. Um, but IRC, we have, a, we have a bot that translates between the two as well. Or hit the mailing list. So we have, we have, or we all understand out here for the next two days. So uh, pretty much I think the Cata guys are going to be on the stand in the afternoon. So if you want to come and ask some Cata questions, probably come by after lunch. Questions, comments? Anybody tried Cata? <laughs> it's happened this morning to somebody as well. Um, I think I've answered my own questions about footprint performance. So uh, I'm going to take that as a good sign. I've told you everything you needed to know. Everybody's happy. Oh, we have a microphone, but I don't. I'll try and uh, if I I'll repeat your question if they can't hear you. Yeah, compared to LXC or LXD, what are the key differences? Yeah, we, we don't normally do a lot of um, comparison with LXC, LXD. Um, generally, we're looking at Docker, Run C. 
So, so I'm not an LXD, LXD expert. Um, so any of the cata guys down the front have any input on LXC, LXD? So no. So um, generally we've, we've targeted the, the major um, cloud stacks. So Docker, Kubernetes, and CRI. So, uh, OK. Hi, um, one question. Oh, um, hi. Hi. Um, is there a plan to support type 1 hypervisors in the future? Is that something that's possible with Kata containers? Type 1, as in the, um, we've discussed with the, the hypervisor people, it's quite difficult just because of the, the level of mapping. Things want to talk to each other, but due to the isolation, you, you just can't see outside. So I think it would involve either some modifications in the actual hypervisor or maybe some sort of transport agent living at that level. So you can have like an Uber process that everybody talks to and then can talk back. So, so we'd like to. Um, it's just probably trickier than the hypervisor we have today. So, okay. Um, one thing I probably didn't, sorry. Uh, it is also multi-architecture. Just because I'm an Intel guy, we have people working on it from IBM. We've got ARM guys. So. Are there some uh, bigger companies uh, besides Intel who are supporting uh, the Qatar project? Yeah, so... On the CAT project, um, we have IBM people working on it, Huawei, Hyper-V, Intel, uh, SUSE are working with us. So yeah, we have quite a growing community now. Um, we're talking to a bunch of the ISVs, and then there's some cloud providers. Some of them, we're working with some I can't mention because that's still work in progress. But yeah, we're, we're aiming at top tier cloud providers. Uh, we've got a Google member on the board. We had an Amazon person before. So, so yeah, we, we do work with the top tier cloud providers and many of the vendors, so. Okay, I think we're out of questions. Thank you very much.